Noi abbiamo un ultimo speaker, eh, abbiamo completato le lettere della parola change con equality, abbiamo un ultimo speaker che è un prodotto autoctono, locale, uno studente della LUIS, ha vinto anche lui il contest e quindi farà il discorso in inglese, dato che la community eh, della, della LUIS è multilinguistica e appunto perché speriamo che questo TED possa valicare i nostri confini. Lui si chiama Nicola Ragazzi, è uno studente del PPE, oggi è il suo potenzialmente ultimo giorno alla LUIS e mi sembra un bel modo per finire. Lo chiamo sul palco. Si fa con questo adesso, vero? Ok, perfetto. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. I'm the last one, but I still hope to be interesting and riveting with my speech. And I decided to start this TED with a question. How many of you have heard or know about Cocomaro di Focomorto, besides my friends, of course? Please, raise your hands. I repeat my question, Cocomaro di Focomorto. Well, I can see many hands raised, which is not surprising, but uh, none actually. So let me tell you that according to the last census conducted on the Italian territory, it is a small fraction in the municipality of Ferrara in the Emilia-Romagna region, and it has 466 inhabitants. And that is where I come from. Now, why does it matter? It matters because to this tiny village is related one of the most personal and intense memories related to the word change. Such a short but impactful and meaningful word that the Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, there's nothing permanent apart from change. Now, however, back to Cocomaro di Focomorto, as I was saying. When I was 16, I moved from this tiny village to embark on an experience that I actually think is quite common among young generations, the so-called exchange year. And I moved to Australia. Now, however, can you imagine from the flat, stuffy Italian countryside to the land of koalas, sharks, snakes, and spiders? Well, that journey was not just a physical relocation, but it was rather a plunge into a whirlwind of unforeseen challenges living in a remote location without my family for the first time, and with that I mean at least 21 hours by plane, dealing with the illness of a loved one. In fact, just when one week prior to my departure, a family member got diagnosed with the morb of Kreuzfeld-Jakob. Now, if any of you searches right now on your mobiles what this illness entail, you'll see that the only thing that matters is that there's no treatment available. And in fact, he passed away just a few months after I came back. And finally, navigating through the global pandemic caused by the COVID-19 that erupted in the midst of my experience and forced me to get back anticipately and to leave the wonderful people and the wonderful culture that had welcomed me. But despite being a crucible, that period ultimately tested my resilience and taught me the importance of embracing change with an open-minded, And I started with this personal story because I really think that one of the underpinning assumptions to my definition of change is that the biggest change lies in the ordinary of life. And today, I'm going to try to persuade you about the fact that as such, change is a universal weapon. And in a world where malign weapons that lead to war, hardship, losses, and death proliferate, Change can and must be considered as a benevolent weapon that affects our life and the life of others. And for the moment, it is sufficient just to bear in mind this. Now, in order to strengthen my claim, I decided to bring on a stage a few rules. The rules that have been discovered by the National Association for Children of Addiction in 2017, NACOA, maybe it's easier, that are supposed to be driving effective change. First rule, change is always a process, which means that the road toward change is never linear, but rather it is full of curves, traffic lights, traffic jams, crossroads, and sometimes stops. The weather on this road can be either sunny, but or also foggy, cloudy, windy, snowy, and stormy. Second rule, what matters in order for positive change to be fostered is the motivation behind it. To 
continue with the metaphor of the weapon, what matters is the intention that lies in the hands of those holding the weapon of change. And third rule, each of us has a potential for change. And here is the argument of the universality. Although seldom straightforward, the road for change is always accessible, and indeed accessible to each one of us. And with these rules in mind, I decided then to provide you with two monumental examples that I have picked from history, not because of, an alter of a lack of alternatives, but rather because I think that these are particularly useful in explaining the idea of the weapon, which means whenever change is enacted, others' lives are affected as well as ours. And the first example dates back to May 10th, 1994, where, actually when, Nelson Mandela became the Prime Minister of the Republic of South Africa. Mandela did not only eradicate apartheid, which meant racial discrimination and segregation toward a portion of the population, what was considered to be the population minority, but he also championed a global ethos for human rights. And despite fraught with many challenges, his leadership showed us that profound change can lead to societal healing and transformation to a point that nowadays South Africa is among the major advocates for human rights at international level, something that back in the 70s, 80s was barely thinkable. Why does it matter, however? Because before that day, Mandela had spent 27 years in jail. Now, what if he had let the negative thoughts populating his mind overwhelm and overcome his strong willingness and desire to bring up that specific change in the South African society. And the same could be said uh, for another leader, more contemporary, Osan Suu Kyi, that after having started a series of reforms in Myanmar, was incarcerated in the aftermath of a coup d'etat that occurred in the state. And she's paradoxically facing up to 27 years in jail. The second example comes from the People's Republic of China. Here, a man known as Deng Xiaoping, after 1979, initiated a series of reforms known as socialism with Chinese characteristics that not only resurrected China's economy from the hardship and losses endured during the 50s, 60s, and 70s with the so-called Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution that had led to around 60 million deaths, but he also contributed, as this sentence says, to China's nowadays positioning among the top three economic superpowers. Change equals nation building. Now, however, why does it matter again? Because at the age of 16, Deng had left his remote village in the Sichuan province, uh, province pardon, to go to France to pursue his studies. What he has simply fallen in love with the, French, with the French culture, something that maybe for us Italians can be difficult, but who knows, I mean. <laughs> Or what he simply surrendered to the idea that being born in a remote area meant not having as many chances as people from the city to reach high positions within the party hierarchy in his home state. I also chose these two examples for two more reasons. The first reason is that these examples come from states that were once considered to be part of a second class world. But after having embraced such changes, nowadays they are among the leaders of the world. And second, because when I read the stories of Deng and Mandela, I understood one thing. Change is a weapon, but most importantly, change is always in our hands. And we do not have to frame it as a barrier, but rather as a beacon that guides us towards growth and innovation. Now, the second time, that I moved from Cocomaro di Focomorto, my beloved village, was to come here to study at Louis. And the third time will be in August to go to Paris for my masters. Again, Paris and Rome are not as far as Australia, but can you still imagine the mentality of farmers like moving from the flat, stuffy Italian countryside to the lively, animated, uh, sometimes often crowded and sometimes noisy capital city of Italy.
But by then, as I said a few seconds ago, I had read the stories of Mandela and Deng, and I understood that it was the right moment to pursue my dream. That dream that had been and still is the fuel of my engine in my humble experience, which is one day to be part of diplomacy and to contribute somehow meaningfully to shifting from relations between states of war in relations between states in terms of peace. And uh, this is really the key of the message that I want to deliver now to my fellow colleagues and to uh, other students and friends. We are at a pivotal moment in our life as we are called to make choices that require big changes. And sometimes between us, those choices and those changes, there are obstacles. And these obstacles may seem insurmountable. However, it's not by surrendering to these negativities, to these adversities, that we foster positive change. Because change is the outcome not only of dedication and commitment, but also of hope and trust. And these two elements, hope and trust, will allow us to stop our car just before the line, whenever the light of the traffic light on the road for change will turn red and will help us to avoid accidents. But at the same time, whenever the light will turn back green, are what will allow us to push on the accelerator faster than before and to get to our goals faster than before. Because, you know, the truth is that the benevolence of change as a weapon is never straightforward. But as long as we will bear in mind the rules for change, the process itself, the motivation we harness, and the potentiality within each of us, that is what will ultimately make the difference. And so I decided to reach the conclusion of my TED with a poem, not just because I like poetry, but because I think it's somehow the perfect closure of the circle. This poem is the, ac is the outcome actually of other two poems. One was written by a Lebanese poet called Khalil Gibran that once said, there's always a new dawn that awaits for us, even behind the darkest night. And I substituted the word dawn with the word change or chance, because after all, there's just a letter of difference between these two words. And then I added two more lines, which have been extracted by the poem Call Us What We Carry by Amanda Gorman, the first ever black poetess to deliver a speech during the inauguration of a US president in 2020, Joe Biden. And here is what we have. Even behind the darkest night, there is always a new change or chance that awaits for us. If only we are brave enough to see that change, that chance. If only we are brave enough to be that change, that chance. At the beginning, I said that the biggest change lies in the ordinary of life. Isn't it like that? I've thought about Mandela and Deng, but think about choices like opting for a university rather than another one for masters, drinking coffee or tea in the morning, wearing a suit or a shirt before a meeting, jumping on this stage and delivering a speech rather than another one for masters. All, sorry, not for masters, but, but for this TED. All these choices still require us to be highly motivated and still require us to be triggering the weapon of change that in the end simply turns out to be our universal weapon to comprehend, transform, alter and impact our lives. And while impacting our lives will turn out to be impacting also the lives of the people beneath, above, behind, in front of, and near us. And to do so, you don't have to be Mandela. You don't have to be Deng. You don't have to be Gibran. You don't have to be Gorman or Rosan Suki. But you must believe, as Einstein once said, believe in the power to use your intelligence as an instrument for change. And that change will arrive, either be it 
a friendship born, a new love, an academic, professional, or personal achievement, a new experience, or a new adventure. And whenever you look back at the road that you have walked on in order to reach that change, you'll be extremely proud of yourselves. So please, don't be afraid of triggering the weapon of change. Thank you very much. <laughs>